Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you the extra nuggets to get your teeth into, give you a greater understanding of the conflict in Ukraine. So much to talk about as ever. I sometimes wonder, what is it I'm doing? Is it, uh, am I just projecting onto you what I find interesting? This is what I find fascinating. Therefore, you're going to find it fascinating. I just package it up and throw it at you. Uh, yes. Uh, is this just, I am an aggregator of information. So basically, uh, I do the legwork of going to look at all these dis disparate sources and different sources and, and pick elements of those sources and then put them in here. Like I've got a few parts of videos today that I think are, are really, you know, distilling maybe an hour's worth of video down to the core parts and then show that to you. So that maybe that's my service I'm providing to you. And now I give you a bit of my sort of, you know, commentary as well. And hopefully you find that, that interesting. So I don't know, this is what it is. Uh, and thank you for coming along this journey with me. I'm going to go first to aircraft. So uh, ben Wallace, the UK Defence Secretary, has said that if the British government were to give fighter jets, it would also have to provide about 200 Royal Air Force personnel. In other words, it's no easy thing to provide these jets, and there's so much involved with that. And I keep referring you back to this conversation between Ward Carroll and the Royal United Service Institute's Justin Bronk. This is an absolutely fantastic conversation that will give you all you need to know about the difficulties with providing um, the jets to Ukraine and, and the whole panoply of, uh, of jets that could be provided from different nations, basically 90% of being can be just thrown off the list because they're just not the right type of jets for, for the job that needs to be done. And you're left with very few types of jets. And even then, you know, there are problems with using them, not least that they are designed for use in a NATO kind of framework of combined arms operations and this isn't a nato uh, combined arms operation this is a war between a soviet nation effectively russia as a soviet nation and a former soviet nation using largely soviet doctrine still um at least to some degree anyway as and and nato jets just don't fit into that easily anyway this conversation and this part of the conversation kind of summarizes that so Justin Bronk is this guy on the right. He's from the RACI, Royal United Services Institute, which is a UK military think tank. But so uh, to, to, to take a few um, to take a few things because uh, you know you see a lot of this stuff um, stemming from some you know really really positive and, and you know, well informed uh, observations around the basing requirements. I see a lot of people saying, well, okay, wouldn't Harrier have been a good idea? What about light attack aircraft? A-10, because, you know, well, at least it's rugged, it can do lots of stuff. Um, tornado, because they've been retired. Um, and it, essentially, I think, just to, to kind of take a lot of those as a as a whole, because the problem is all the same. Um, the Ukrainians' primary requirement is for air-to-air -air capability that works at low level in an extremely contested surface-to-air missile engagement zone. Um, None of those options have any chance against Russian fighters head-to-head -head anyway, let alone at low level uh, in a very, very dangerous multiple layers of sand threatened set bit booted block of airspace. So none of them work um, for the requirement. There's a, and, and there's a very good reason why, why people kind of default to those things. And, and often I also see this linked to tanks, people saying, well, Tanks require air cover, you know, without air cover, how can we, you know, there's a waste to send tanks almost as a justification for trying to convince people to send, to send aircraft. That only applies to the way we fight. We in the West have configured our militaries for 70 plus years to rely on air power to allow us to have outsized battlefield effect with very small, comparatively speaking, land forces. So we, and, and our primary and, you know, pretty much required first step in any serious conflict of any kind is to establish air superiority because that's where the majority of our firepower comes from. It's where the majority of our force situational awareness comes from. But that's because that's the way we've built our forces because we can. So we that is increasingly harder and harder specifically because it worked so well for so many decades Russia and China as well, but but in this case Russia, because it's the relevant one, have specifically designed their modern inter integrated air defense systems, so their mobile 
surface to air missile batteries and all the radars and the architectures and everything else that, that connect them to negate that air power advantage. And so, you know, people say, well, NATO air power, we would do this. We need to give the Ukrainians NATO air power. That's not going to work. NATO would struggle to establish air superiority over the Ukrainian front lines. It would take months to get all the logistics and the maintenance and the training and all of the, the, the complex air operation packages and everything ready. And so the idea, and, and even then we would lose aircraft and it would, there would be horrendous risk of escalation and all that stuff. Yes, we would eventually be able to do it. It's not that NATO couldn't write down the Russian integrated air defense system and then ultimately have extremely powerful battlefield effect with direct attack munitions of various kinds, um, as we've had in, in other conflicts. But it would be a month. Uh, you know, it would be a long campaign, a long process. We would lose aircraft, and that's with the whole panoply of support. That's with all the um, I Star aircraft, the intelligence surveillance target acquisition reconnaissance aircraft, so things like River Joint, um, Joint Stars that go out there and map um, an IADS, track where all the emitters are, um, map how it all works, what frequencies they're on all the electronic warfare support, so things like the Growler, previously the Prowler, Compass Call, um, you know, incre increasingly things like Wedgetail, the US is investing a lot now in, in active electronic warfare for precisely this requirement. Um, all of the suppression assets, so things like harm, but that's just one aspect you're just suppressing with that. You're not really getting hard kills most of the time. Um, loads of very high-end jammers, things like Mold, Mold X in particular, which can kind of jam and also... Um, spoof being being an aircraft to so try and stimulate those defenses and force them to engage things uh loitering munitions of various kinds and all the strike aircraft plus fifth gen you know with you know things like f-35 f-22 b2 b21 coming in all of that stuff would still be, be required in it to it would take weeks to write down that russian iads once you had everything in place so the idea that by giving the ukrainians a handful of western fighters with none of the other enablers let alone the years of training, not just the air crew, but the, the all of the training and the career's worth of expertise in running those operations that our commanders have in, in chaos, so combined air operations centers, to actually sequence, plan, brief, command these sorts of complex operations. You just can't port that across into another country, um, especially one that's never operated air power that way. So yes, Air, Western air, 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 aircraft will be needed by the Ukrainian Air Force. Yes, they would be a significant Im improvement on their current jets. Yes, we should get them them. But we shouldn't be under illusions as to what they will accomplish and what they're for. They will not establish battlefield dominance over the Russian army in Ukraine. That is not possible with a handful of Western jets. Um, and most of our ground-to-air capabilities are intended for use from medium level with a targeting pod outside of a SAM missile engagement zone with well-trained pilots with JTACs on the ground. They're not intended for employment from very, very low level under a high-end threat picture, to lobbing weapons from a couple of kilometers away, which is what you'd have to do in Ukraine and what, what the Ukrainians and, and the Russians, of course, the Russians too have faced this problem. This is the whole reason the Russians don't have air superiority, is they can't do this against a much lower end air defense system. The Ukrainian air defense system is massively less capable than the Russian one. And yet the Russian Air Force, which for all its flaws, has a hell of a lot more capability stored up in it than a handful of Western jets, given to Ukrainian pilots with a few months conversion training, however brave and skillful they are. The Russian Air Force has been unable to establish air superiority over the battlefield just facing the Ukrainian air defenses. So we really do need to be realistic about this. And uh, and it goes on. I advise you to to watch that. He's he's absolutely spot on. And it, it, during this, he talks about how Gripen, the Swedish fighter, is probably the best fighter for for the job, the best aircraft for the role, uh, given how it can take off from rougher, shorter airfields. Um, the the FOD, these bits of debris on the airfields that that is a problem for Ukrainian airfields, won't get sucked up up into the plane as much as say for F-16s and other other Western fighters and so on and so forth. And it's, it is much better in the role that it will be envisaged uh, as you're using so on and so forth. So Gripen is probably the best, but the chance of that being given, you know, in, in meaningful numbers and what would have to, what would have to, what it would entail uh, is just, it's quite unrealistic at the moment. This is why we see 
these Western governments saying kind of repeatedly, no, no, no. Uh, because, and he, he talks in, in this about, you know, if you're going to have a set amount of money that you can throw at this or resources or time or whatever, it's like, do we put that into the aircraft that might have some effect on the battlefield or do we put it into, I don't know, you know, main battle tanks or training up people on IFVs or giving these, these the sort of systems over here, uh, you know, it's the cost benefit analysis of each of these decisions and the aircraft decision, you know, it's, is getting shunted down a list of priorities for all the reasons he's given there. It just, you know, the, the amount of air defenses on both sides, you know, Ukraine, the, he talks quite a lot about how cautious the Russian air services have been. As soon as they just take one or two losses, they then retreat back and start doing things further back. It's really interesting. The last couple of weeks, we've seen them start to be a little bit more risky to try and do that combined arms initiative and support the the ground troops in the Bakhmut area, and then they get hit. Yeah, and that's a Ukrainian air defense system, which is you know arguably far less capable than than the Russians with their San 300s and San 400s and so on and so forth. Throwing them at throwing them like ten F-16s or whatever is 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 not going to be the panacea that I think people think it is. And even I was thinking, you know, I've been arguing that, that we should do that. It's not to take them off the table, but it requires an awful lot more thought and a heck of a lot more wider range of support than just giving those those aircraft. There, there are these other support things that need to be in place. And he's talking a lot about seed activity, suppression of air, enemy air defense, which needs to happen at the beginning of the war. That hasn't happened on either side, so there's contested airspace which means that using those kind of uh, of aircraft is hugely problematic without that air superiority. So the first thing you would need to do is absolutely hammer those those air defences, um, so on and so forth. Now, next thing I want to talk about is another piece of equipment that is not being given to the Ukrainians, uh, and there's been so much conversation about it. It's the ATACMS. What is the ATACMS and what has been given? Just to remind you that HIMARS are these high mobility artillery rocket systems, the M142, and they usually uh, send up pods of rockets, a number of guided rockets that then have, at, with Ukraine at the moment, the rockets they are able to use that the Americans have given them are have an 84 kilometer range, so six a pod of six MLRS, or it can send one ATACMS. So they slot with a slightly different pod they send one big old a tacoms and that is is a sizable rocket this has a 300 kilometer range so it's got a far greater range uh, it'll just be a case of kind of swapping the pods over to these a tacoms and then using them why don't we give them uh, these a tacoms i've been calling out for it lots of people have been calling out for it uh, and there's been lots of conversation about this, this article from The Drive being one particular one talking about, you know, Ukrainian HIMARS can't fire long-range ATACMS missiles, you know, why that is is or isn't the case. Um, but Jake Bro, three months ago, who's another YouTuber, does, you know, far bigger than I'll ever be, uh, who, who had a, a chat on this, and some of the arguments he provides actually make a lot of sense as to why ATACMS isn't being provided so i'm going to let him do the talking here now the first factor we have to consider is cost how much does one but and he's he's comparing high mars like a pod of six high mars missiles to a pod of one atacans missiles like hey Mar, high mars like 84 kilometer kilometer range missiles guided missiles versus the one bigger one one of these larger longer range missiles cost to give to the Ukrainians. And according to a Military Today article, I'm seeing $820,000 for a single missile, but this figure is probably a couple of years old. So I think it's appropriate to round up and say about $1 million for a single large, longer range Attackums missile. Now with the Gimlers, the shorter range, I've seen estimates from uh, 100,000 up to this war zone article where uh, some official was quoted as saying 168,000 per missile. So we're gonna round up and use the more expensive figure. And it's important to remember how many missiles are in a pod for the Gimlers. When you're launching the smaller missiles, you can fit 
six in a cartridge, six in a pod. But when you launch an Attackums, it's just one. This thing is huge. It takes up an entire pod, an entire missile. So here is the cost breakdown and the basic target breakdown comparing the two. And for six Gimlers, it costs about $1 million. For in a single Attackums, once again, costs about $1 million. Now, with these missiles, they're both GPS-guided. You can independently target six different sites if you really want to, if you have GMLRS. But with an Attackums, you're only hitting one place that night. If a High Mars crew can get maybe one or two cartridges fired off in an evening before they have to shoot and scoot, they're not targeting as much when using Attackums. So this already gives Gimlers a slight advantage for the same cost structure. You can target six different sites. Now the Ukrainians do double tap and triple tap lots of these sites to make sure they go boom. Uh, but still, you're getting more done by using Gimlers as opposed to Attackums. The other consideration that I don't hear people talk about ever when considering Attackums is how effective is Russia's air defense systems against Gimlers and against Attackums? Russia has two deployed air defense systems operating in Ukraine. There's the older Soviet S-300 missile system, and then the more modern, I guess more capable, S-400 missile system. And this is the meme on the internet the last four months. What the heck has Russian air defense been doing as all of their fuel warehouses, ammunition depots, command posts, they've all been destroyed by the Ukrainians. Russia's S-300 and S-400 air defense systems prior to this war were considered to be pretty darn good. But so far they've been proven to be incapable of shooting down Gimlers. And at this point in the war, this is a proven fact. Russia's air defense systems are useless against Gimlers, and I suspect that the Pentagon and NATO knew this when they decided to supply Gimlers and not attack them four months ago. It is possible that there could be a software update in which Russia's air defense system gets its act together and they can start shooting down these Gimlers, but because they're smaller missiles that go a shorter distance, they're just not in the air as long, and their radar systems get confused, thinking they're just simple artillery rounds. Well, let's now consider the Attackums. This is a much larger missile for Russian radar to spot and track. It stays in the air longer, once again, making it easier for radar to spot and track. So this might be the answer why the West has not provided Ukraine with Attackums. They're not confident that Attackums missiles will actually hit their targets because Russia's air defense systems might be able to actually shoot them down. So what the West has been doing the last four months is supplying Ukraine with weapon systems to destroy Russia's air defense systems. A big uh, force multiplier in this war was... So it goes on to talk about, you know, harm uh, being used and uh, this being... The way uh, these were, you know, it was big news when they were providing harm missiles. So these are the missiles that that take out radiation sources of radiation. You fire them from from uh, jets, and they will they will take out a radar installation, which then means possibly going forward, the U.S. could supply ATACMs and be able to get through those air defense networks. But uh, I, I think it's a really interesting point that you know, bang for your buck. ATACMs have got a stronger chance of being shot down by air defense. Gimlers aren't getting shot down. You're getting six pops, even though they're probably smaller missiles. They're smaller missiles. They are they are getting through there. They'll be having devastating effect behind the Russian lines up to that kind of 90 kilometer range mark. It's just too much risk to give ATACMs uh, at the moment. But could it be that we see them being given going forward? We shall see. He then goes on to say, you know, he calls it a logic flow, where it's the first, first of all, the U.S. has decided ATACMs aren't the best for Ukraine, or NATO's decided ATACMs aren't the best for Ukraine. Uh, 
convince the Russians that you're doing them a favor by not providing them. Well, hey, we're not escalating. We're just providing gimblers. If Russia collapses, they won't be needed. But if it, if it escalates, if the conflict escalates, then they always can go, actually, we're going to give you eight Atoms now. Uh, and, and then, you know, once there's a critical failure of the Russian air defense, that's the time to provide those eight Atoms. So I, I think I, I think this is a pretty good analysis. There's probably lots of more things you can think about. But simply, you know, if you're looking at cost and the chance of it getting uh, taken down, then Gimlers do make sense. But the question is whether we got to a point where the Ukrainians, sorry, I say, say we because I'm thinking like as NATO, um, whether Ukraine have got to, to the point where all of those targets have been effectively taken out in that 84 kilometer, 90 kilometer range. And whether they are just now starting to think, well, what what can we hear? There are other things, and that, that's kind of right. Okay, we we really they've moved their their depots back behind that mark. We now need a attack, and so we now need something else. So whether that point has been reached, or whether the, obviously NATO foot, are obviously thinking, uh, in a cost benefit analysis, it is not worth it's not worth our while sending a attackers. I mean, they're obviously thinking that because they're not sending them. So. This is a comment from uh, the Joint Chiefs uh, Chairman General, Mark Milley, uh, declaring that Russia has lost the war in Ukraine. Quote, they've lost strategically, operationally and tactically, and they are paying an enormous price on the battlefield, he says. While Russia has waged this war for far too long, they will not outlast Ukraine people, nor the group of allies and partners that met today. Uh, this is an interesting statement, the idea that, that they've lost, uh, and he's obviously talking about this, well, he's talking strategically, operationally, and tactically, which is to say they've lost the war. I, uh, I agree with this, and I think um, I wrote in April last year, as I keep telling you, uh, an article saying that there's no way Putin can win. I mean, he can't win. But I think there's maybe a difference saying you can't win, and they have lost. And he, what Milly here is what he's doing is kind of predicting the future or seeing where this is going which is say i can see no way that they can win which is to say they have lost but i, I don't semantics maybe i think it's possibly as shashank joshi here says this strikes me as nonsense strategic loss is one thing but if you are grinding out modest advances in donbass then that's a tactical gain by definition the point is that these gains are coming at a cost which in all likelihood would imperil russia's position down the line I think that's what Mark Milley's doing, is he, he's, he's looking at it down the line. I think it's dangerous to say they have lost already, because if you start saying that in public, then people go, oh, okay, we don't need to support to support Ukraine, we don't need to keep putting all this money in military aid and humanitarian aid forth, and so on and so forth. Uh, but actually, it, it's saying, well, given all these things re remaining in place, then Russia will lose. Uh, go, they have lost. I mean, we're just making a, a really surefire prediction for the future. Again, be worried about hidden variables and unknown variables and predicting the future that we don't know, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's quite a risk to say something like that, although I kind of agree with with why why he's kind of said that. Okay, going to talk, uh, or going to listen to, I know this is a third time that I'm putting on someone else to say something, but these are all just really great nuggets of information here this is coming from someone on the ukraine latest uh, podcast uh, a military man barry uh, ben barry a senior research fellow for land warfare at the international institute for strategic studies uh, he i think his former forces himself and this is his kind of appraisal of the the um of the war Thanks so much, Ben. Just one more quick question from me, if that's all right. What do you see as the main obstacles for both sides going forward? And uh, and what would you what would you recommend our listeners look out for in the next few months? What will you be looking for in, in, in the conflict in the months to come? Well, probably best if I just give you a quick burst on, on what I see as the shape of the war. Please, that's uh, good. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a couple of minutes, but Ukraine has stated plans for counteroffenses to push the Russians out of their country. And for this, they've said they want at least 10 armoured brigades with modern Western armour. And the key thing about the modern Western armour is it's much better protected than obsolete Western armour or indeed uh, Soviet-style armour. So that's why they've requested a 1,000 modern armoured fighting vehicles, 300 tanks and the remainder infantry fighting vehicles. 
Now, we're monitoring the declarations by Ukraine's allies, and as at this morning, we reckoned that what was declared that could reach Ukraine by the summer was about 25, 25% of this. What does Moscow seek to do? That's a very interesting um, sort of state of affairs, isn't it? So Ukraine know what they want. They, they You might think they're pushing the envelope saying, we want all this, but at the end of the day, they want to win the war. So they want to, they, they're asking for stuff that will enable them to win the war. Plenty of enough military equipment to win that war. So X amount of stuff, a thousand pieces of this, well, actually, you're going to get about 25% of that. Okay, what does that say about how easy it's going to be for Ukraine to to take this to the Russians. Well, not as easy as they're hoping. I mean, this is it's not underwhelming. They've been given loads of stuff, but is that enough? Well, Putin has not changed his objectives of regime change in Ukraine. And he seems to be playing it long in terms of wanting to outlast Ukraine and its allies and is willing to accept heavy losses in doing so. He's also stated a medium-term objective of achieving full control of the Donbass and of the Zaporizhia and Kherson oblasts. Now, it's not clear to me that as things currently stand, uh, the Russian army can concentrate enough capable and competent formations to achieve this. So in the meantime, Russia will continue to fortify its defences and continue also to attempt to pin Ukrainian forces and inflict attrition with these First World War-style artillery and in, in and um, infantry attacks. We can also expect intermittent Russian missile and drone attacks on civilian infrastructure. But remember that every single missile and drone that's fired at a civilian heating plant, an electricity plant, or indeed a, a, a railway junction box, is a missile that can't be fired at military targets. Now, for both sides, spring will make attacking easier, and political factors impel both sides to attack. Now, whichever side... On the one hand, it will make it easy. On the other hand, you will have all the muds that come with spring, that spring thaw. So, yeah, there is, a, there is a, a theory to say that actually attacking now, as the Russians are doing, is, is the sensible option rather than waiting a couple of months uh, and then getting seriously bogged down. Attacks first will get both politically and military first mover advantages, but will also expose themselves to counterattack by the defender's artillery and ammunition. Now, quite clearly, the Russians are busy fortifying their position, position to achieve that. Construction of linear defences, um, anti-tank ditches and, and rows of dragon's, dragon's teeth. Uh, the Ukrainians also have probably developed defences in depth, and both sides may well be holding armoured reserves at the tactical and operational level, uh, so that if a successful attack is staged by their enemies, they can then delay it and, and counterattack it. Uh, but provided Ukraine is supplied with sufficient ammunition and modern Western equipment, and this continues, I think the balance of political and battlefield leadership, as well as the Western weapons, will probably give Ukraine tactical advantage. But it's not clear that Kiev has enough combat power to eject Russian forces as quickly as it or its supporters would like. Now, we have to remember this has been a terrible war. Um, you know, I was in the war in Bosnia, and that was bad enough, but this is much worse. Oh, we can expect another bloody year, I think, with unpredictable action-reaction dynamics as both sides stroll for the initiative at the strategic, operational, and tactical uh, levels. So that's as I see it from my humble desktop. Very interesting. And uh, Russia are playing for the long game. They will be putting on this offensive. Ukraine will be looking to this offensive, having their own kind of idea where they want to do their own counter offences, but they will need to adapt to what Russia are doing, whether they'll leave themselves open for a counter offensive on that offensive or whether Ukraine keep to their original ideas of where they would like to do their counter offensives. Um, so, for example, I'm just going to kind of make this up, but if, if Russia push really heavily against uh, Kremlin and do a, an offensive around there, it may be that, that Ukraine had originally envisaged doing an attack down to Mariupol, maybe from Vukovar, or I don't know, down to Melitopol or whatever, and then maybe doing one up uh, near, near Svatova. Uh, again, making this up. Uh, Russia do their offensive here and then lead themselves ripe for a counterattack and actually weaken the flanks maybe at the base of where they attacked. It, it could be that... that Ukraine have to react to that and say, okay, we're not going to do this fatter attack now. We're going to 
uh, adapt to attacking here at the base near Kremina and then so on and so forth. So, you know, they, they will have their ideas of what they need to do, but it, the, the, those may be adapted. But we will, we, we, we're in this for possibly for the long haul. So Russian offensive, then the counter offensives, and then probably mass mobilization or mass mobilization during that for the Russians and possibly even for the Ukrainians. And then this will be Russia hoping that support for the war will lessen with Ukraine's allies and that they'll eventually be able to win this war of attrition uh, by using time to their advantage. And of course, you know, data like this I already talked about today plays into that, which is American polling saying that 48% of people in the US claim they favor the US providing weapons to Ukraine with 29% of uh, Americans being against giving Ukraine military aid and 22% say they need a support um, or oppose nor oppose further aid to Ukraine. In May 2022, so less than three months into the Russian full-scale invasion, so that's nine months ago, 60% of Americans claim they're in favor of supply weapons. So that has dropped 12%, and that is a significant drop in, in support for American aid, whether that's as a result of people like Tucker Carlson and certain people in the media uh, uh, attacking the the Ukrainians it's a bit of kind of being Russian appeasers uh, and attacking the government whether it's because that's what Biden wants to do therefore we're going to attack Biden we're going to attack the Democrats because we're staunchly Republican I know a lot of you listening are Republicans who don't feel that so I, I'm not I'm not tiring everyone with the same brush here but I'm I, I'm trying to explain that there, there are people you know on the right in America who are doing this I don't know whether that is having a meaningful effect on the people watching that or whether this is a general, kind of, to use a military term, a general attrition of people's support. Because actually, a year's a long time. You start thinking about other things. You're not watching channels like this on a daily basis. You don't know where Ukraine is on a map. You don't really care because actually you're worried about the cost of fuel. You're worried about, you know, keeping your job in an economic, you know, precarious economic situation, so on and so forth. There are other things that you're worried about. And then you hear the headline of America giving another $10 billion of aid to Ukraine. And you think that's money out of kind of your pocket as taxpayers' money that's going and being shunted to to a war on the other side of the world. And actually you want your whatever support from, from the government yourself. So you kind of, even if that's misleading, that's, that's not quite an accurate representation of how aid gets to Ukraine uh, and where that money is taken from. If, you're, if that's not been communicated to you successfully because you're watching certain sources or just in the absence of any source, you just you just don't hear about this, then you're going to have your support for Ukraine. Even though it's a moral support initially, it's going to be eroded away because there are other priorities in your life. Uh, and and the, I think one of the main things now is to keep that support up there for people. You know, that is... Although... I'm not, I'm trying to be accurate with what I say. I also have a moral agenda, not an agenda, but I have a moral position. And I would like to see that support for Ukraine maintained. And I'm playing a tiny, tiny little part in that. And people attack me for not being, you know, objective enough. Well, it's difficult because I am supportive of Ukraine. I'm morally and politically against Russia, but I want to be accurate with what I report. However, I have my own curated news sources and I'm, I'm probably not enough reporting to you the losses that Ukraine are making. I am aware of this. Uh, and so there is, there is this, you know, am I just presenting good news all the time? So I will be thinking about my, my own little sort of pile of sources to, and how I curate that going forward. But, but I also do want to, to see that support for Ukraine maintained because I think it's super important ge geopolitically and morally speaking. Um, anyway, that's just a little sidebar. Let's now move on. And just to then cycle back to, well, what are the Russians doing at the moment? This is, well, hashtag ATP007. Again, uh, I reckon these experts are watching my uh, videos because this is exactly what I've been saying the last couple of days. Uh, obviously not again, I would say this. A uh, new Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine, more aspirational than realistic. Uh, says Western, uh, say Western officials, as from CNN. Um, uh, US and UK and Ukrainian officials tell CNN, 
uh, this same kind of message. So, quote, it's likely more aspirational than realistic, said a senior U.S. military official. Despite the increase in numbers, Western allies have not seen evidence of sufficient changes to those forces' ability to carry out combined arms operations needed to take and hold new territory. Quote, it's unlikely Russian forces will be particularly better organized and so unlikely they'll be particularly more successful, though they do seem willing to send more troops into the meat grinder, a senior British official told CNN. The US military had assessed it would take as long as until May for the Russian military to regenerate enough power for a sustained offensive. But Russian leaders wanted action sooner. The US now sees it as likely that Russian forces are moving before they're ready due to political pressure from the Kremlin, the senior US military official told CNN. This is exactly what they're saying the last few days, which is, I have a feeling that you know, Putin has said you, we need the Donbass by the end of March, and that's pushed the Russians to not doing a spring offensive, but a winter offensive, back end of winter, and they are doing this offensive without having necessary personnel and materiel in place. And so therefore, for political ends they are going to do a kind of half fast offensive that arguably will not succeed um, because it is it is poorly thought through and rushed uh, so to continue the article um, though ukrainian officials have been sounding the alarm about new russian attacks in the east there is also skepticism on the ukrainian side about russian capabilities as those forces currently stand quote they amassed enough by a manpower, sorry, to take one or two small cities in Donbass, but that's it, a senior Rus Ukrainian diplomat told CNN. Quote, underwhelming compared to the sense of panic they were trying to build in Ukraine. So we did have this kind of claim a couple of weeks ago from the Ukrainians that there's going to be a massive attack offensive. Now, you must remember that they might be saying those sort of things to kick the West and, and the US and other allied nations into action to give them more and more stuff. There's going to be a huge attack. Please help us. Okay, here's loads of stuff. Right, job done. Thank you. Or they may have actually genuinely believed that at the time, but now they 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 they're seeing that really there aren't the amassed um, troops and arguably uh, air power that that they they were imagining, and so therefore this could be not a damp squib, but but certainly less of an offensive uh, than they were worried uh, it would be. So the article finishes that you, and this, this builds on what actually Ben Wallace, the UK Defence Secretary, was saying yesterday in the Radio 4 Today programme. I played you a little bit of that earlier today. Um, and this CNN article continues, US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin said Tuesday in Brussels that the US is not seeing Russia, quote, massing its aircraft ahead of an aerial operation against Ukraine. So this is in light of the, the, these rumours going around on social media that there were a lot of uh, Russian air capabilities amassing over the border in Russia. Whether that was the Russians putting that forward as a kind of psyops, uh, but but in terms of the actual, you know, there were some claims that there were were there were satellite images that showed this, but then you know the cloud cover and whatnot maybe making it more difficult to to make a definite calculation. But the Austin continues or, or, or states in this article, in terms of whether or not Russia is massing its aircraft for some massive aerial attack, we don't currently see that. We do know that Russia has a substantial number of aircraft in its inventory and a lot of capability left, he said. That's why we've emphasized that we need to do everything that we can to get Ukraine as much air defense capability as we possibly can. So it's not so much about concentrating on getting the aircraft over as I talked about earlier to Ukraine. Let's concentrate on air defense and knocking out the Russian air defense and then we can talk about aircraft, possibly. Okay, uh, moving on to something uh, rather different here. This It's just interesting to see how this war has gone. Right at the beginning, the first week of the war, right, a year's a long time, right? The first week of the war, most people are saying, well, Ukraine are going to get their butts kicked and the Russians themselves on social media were saying, including, you know, pretty important people like Medvedev, as you will see in a second, saying, well, you know, game over. It's game over. And But really, was it? So as this uh, this commentator says, what I really enjoy reading is uh, Russian Telegram channels posts from the beginning of the full-scale invasion. How is a three-day operation going? And this is something to ask of all the pro-Russian um, commenters in the threads below. It's like, oh, yeah, wonderful. I know you disagree with everything I say, but... How is that three-day 
special military operation going? How is the SMO going? Is this an SMO? Is this still an SMO? Is this a, just a special military operation? Or is it a full-blown war? And how, how, how's that going for you? you know, a year later? 15 days? A year later? Going how you expected it? Because this was a kind of conversation that was happening at the beginning of the war. So, uh, says this particular person, air defense of Ukraine destroyed. Uh, sorry, Ukrainian air defense of Ukraine destroyed. Ukrainian aviation is destroyed. Uh, Ukrainian fleet is destroyed. Uh, Bayraktar TB2, Turkish air defense systems are no more. And then is it just, I mean, this is, you know, thousands of these, right? Another person says, um, turn to Z on February the 24th, according to our 100% data, 100% data this, the stationary air defense of Ukraine no longer exists. Apart from several months later, something like 85% of it still existed, but there you go. Um, uh, probably because of this text, many people are angry at me. Uh, Vladimir Tatarsky, February 24th, pilots write, Russian aviation suppressed, all air defense from this first approach. There were no targets left for the second event. Um, and uh, Medvedev uh, says, air defense, I don't know. So that's quite, it probably is in Andrei Medvedev, yeah. Uh, air defense of Ukraine no longer exists. That is, in general. Uh, what the cruise missiles did not work in the first wave was destroyed by aviation. So from one event, Iskanders will be added. So these are crew, uh, these are these are missiles will be added to distant airfields based on the logic of modern warfare. And here we wrote more than once or twice: air defense operators, Bayraktar, uh, will be the main targets. That's how it turned out. So obviously the Google translation here isn't perfect, but the idea is that hey, what we didn't take out in the first wave of missiles will be t- taken out by aviation. Air force is gone. This is, you know, game over. Uh, but really, is that what happened? Uh, evidently not. In fact, the airspace is still entirely contested, which is kind of what we've been talking about. Okay, just to sort of start wrapping things up, because I'm going to go over, yes, um, I may leave the rest till later, actually. So I'm going to leave this video here now, and I'm going to do a second one a little bit later if I have time. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for your uh, viewership. I really appreciate all your support. Please like, subscribe, and share. And uh, all the ways you can help the channel are in the description below. Really, really does help me. Uh, I I really appreciate it. Thank you all the people who do buy me a copy, copy, PayPal, and all the members. Wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, Appreciate that. Anyway, take care, and I'll speak to you hopefully relatively soon.